Kalispera. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this panel of the afternoon session that is always a difficult time of a long conference like this. Uh, thanks, Nicholas and Olga, for organizing a, a beautiful event, as always. I think it's been very informative. And um, uh, our panel will try, after so many well-said things uh, during the morning and later, we will try to show some practical ideas. Because, you know, with my fellow panelists, who are people who would like to be innovative, we would like to embrace technologies and new things. We have to face challenges, but uh, in the end of the day, we have to do the job. And to do the job, we need to be practicable. And uh, people like the distinguished panelists that I have on my, on my left uh, have to do this job on a day-to-day -day basis. We have so many things happening in the last years that we couldn't expect, pandemics, wars, in unstable situations, the political all around, compared with energy crisis, paired with uh, a, a lot of challenges for decarbonizing uh, our planet. It's, it's, it's a difficult mixture to understand and navigate. We need a compass that it is difficult to find, and um, it's not so easy. You know, companies like classification societies, like RINA that I represent, I'm a senior director for the Marine of RINA, um, try to be next to their clients like consultants, a part of regulators. So this is our major part of what we need to do and clarify things happening. Anyway, I don't want to take more of your time. Uh, I would like to introduce the panelists of today. So from uh, the left side is Mr. Gregory Spudalakis, who is the uh, general manager for Greece of Colombia. Mr. Spiros Tarasis, another Spiros, I am Spiros as well, uh, Chief Operating Officer for the Tribac Fleet of uh, Costamara Shipping Services and also Vice Chairman of Intercargo, Mr. Marcos Vasilikos, Managing Director of Eurobulk, uh, Mr. Costas Contes, Managing Director of Bishops Greece, and we were supposed to have Mr. George Saroglu. Ah, he's coming, I see George. Right on the mo he wanted to make a, a very impressive entry. Great. Great. Thank you. Th thank you, George. George Saroglu, Chief Operating Officer of, of TEN. So we have five very well-known professionals that do this day-of-day -day operational business for their companies, and they represent different companies, different fleets, different type of vessels, different approach. We have third-party management companies, while we have also traditional companies that have uh, are making management. We would like to have their ideas on how they approach these kind of issues. Not only decarbonization, that a lot has been taught today, but also other things regarding human element training. I was very happy to hear again that we are going back to the zero incident. A lot has been said about zero carbon, but zero incident is very, very, very important for shipping and it has been said more than uh, many times in the morning. So, a, a general question, uh, uh, in order to close the subject of, of all these uh, things that we will have from 1st of January 2023 on all these indexes that are coming into force for shipping, and uh, definitely all my colleagues here are uh, not sleeping at night trying to find how to operate their fleet. So the general question is all these indexes, like the EXI and especially the CII, which is an operational index, how there have been said many things, and we heard this morning that uh, probably they are not so clear of the way they affect decarbonization. Maybe they are uh, distorted because you have two diff same vessels doing different, uh, same voyages, but on ballast or non ballast, and have uh, very strange results on their operational profiles. Uh, how do you think that, anyway, this is a, a rule, how do you think that you can cope with this kind of a challenge from the 1st of January. Gregory, would you like to tell us about your company? What do you think to face this kind of things for your fleet? Certainly. Thank you, Spiros. Thanks also for the invitation for uh, uh, organizers of this event. Uh, obviously, companies uh, like Columbia Asset Management, and it gives me a great pleasure to see that we are not the only ones, have been working on uh, meeting these requirements well in advance and being prepared. There has been investment on digitalization, investment on uh, training, um, analysis on performance, on weather routing, analysis of uh, how we can 
uh, optimize ourselves, optimize voyage, in order to be able uh, well in advance to meet these requirements. And actually, we see nowadays when the time is is getting closer that the pools and uh, oil majors they are very much interested to see where we are at this stage before the implementation. They ask us to do an assessment. They ask us to see where we where we place ourselves, specific vessels. So obviously being already prepared gives an advantage for those that uh, have well in advance uh, get uh, in this uh, status, but also for those that uh, they haven't, uh, it's good to know that there are companies able to provide this service. Also, besides the technology, obviously you need to take care of your people. You need to have this kind of culture, this kind of mentality. You need to have uh, the proper team invested in people not only as we used to in engineering and uh, masters but also we see that it's necessary to have people working in IT software developing people uh, health specialists that they are able to provide uh, more information and uh, this analysis to be used later on for meeting and being compliant with Thank you, Gregory. Uh, regarding the tools that you mentioned, uh, do you develop inside your company? Are you outsourcing? How is the strategy of Columbia on that? Yes. Uh, you need to be able to come in advance. And to do so, uh, you need to see new partnerships, new alliances, but also to develop, as we said, the people you are working with inside the company. So for some cases, we have been able to outsource, and for some others, who have been recruiting uh, specialists to do so. Within Columbia, we have uh, developed our uh, POCR with a partnership of Tutotheo, uh, which is uh, a couple of years back, and uh, give us a, a good advantage to see that uh, we, we are in the good process of uh, and well in advance of the requirements. Uh, to provide uh, information and advantage regarding uh, uh, Voyage optimization, weather routing, aging performance, uh, hull optimization, and especially provide feedback when this is necessary to, to the clients or to the vessel that we manage in general, where uh, time comes for uh, hull cleaning or what kind of special coating to be applied to meet up and improve uh, the index that we see they are coming shortly. Great, thank you, Gregory. Same question on the CII headache for uh, Spiros. Spiro, what about Costa Mare fleet? What is your tip and tri tips and tricks for? What is the chance for two Spiros to be in the same panel? <laughs> thank you for uh, inviting me here. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Olga. Um, I have to agree with Gregory. Uh, everything should be ready, and uh, I have to point out that uh, uh, good shipping companies have already many years ago uh, tried all these things. Um, digitalization, uh, data collection. Uh, I have been collecting data since 2005. Um, installation of uh, energy saving devices that has been done in the past from 2005, Mavis Ducts, um, uh, PBCFs, uh, uh, silicon paints. So uh, owners are well prepared and they know all about uh, what is coming. Now, specifically for the rules, uh, the EXI is something that uh, ship owners and uh, international associations, even uh, Intercargo and uh, other associations, were asking to reduce speeds since five years ago. Uh, and I believe this is the only thing that we can do presently with the present technologies that we have and with the present fuels that we have in order to save the environment, the planet, and so on. So uh, with EXI, maybe 90% of the bulk carrier fleet worldwide will have to cut uh, engine power from 20 to 40%. Uh, and we are ready for this also. We have to do it, we are ready to do it. Uh, keep in mind that we are going to burn fuel for the next 10, 15 years. So this is something that we have to do. Uh, for CII is a different story because uh, CII is an operational index and uh, us as ship owners we take all the orders that we have from the charters. 
So uh, this is something, again, that we need to get together, uh, talk with the charters, uh, talk amongst us, uh, and decide how we are going to operate the vessels. Uh, of course, we have uh, a decision making that, okay, we will not exceed the speed because we need to keep our vessels in the CII, but we must be covered also by the Charter Party. And this is something under debate. Even now, as we speak, maybe three months before the, the rule comes into force, there is no CII clause that we can use in our Charter Parties, and whatever CII clause we have been uh, trying to put in uh, is denied by the Charters. So, you see, we need to cooperate. It's not a one man or one company deal here. We need to find synergies and we need to be together in this in order to meet any target that we are going to have. Because believe me, the targets are going to change and maybe they are going to be more stricter in the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Spiro. In fact, that's that's a situation, and uh, if you, if you think that we have to make all these changes, and, and we, as we said before, on the same time, keep the safety aspect on to, as top priority, because we don't have to forget how difficult it is to transport products from point A to point B. It's not an easy business to adapt new uh, technology situations. It's becoming more complex. Anyway, I go on to Marcos Vasilikos. Marco, your views. Your experience. What is your instinct saying about uh, next year? Um, this is going to, 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 to uh, first of all, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, uh, Nico, for the invitation. It's uh, my pleasure being here. Um, uh, the EXI. Uh, obviously, we have to deal with two different matters here: EXI regulation and the CII regulation. Um, the EXI, uh, there isn't really much we can do. Uh, it is a fixed uh, design number, um, and um, most, the majority of the ships built uh, before 2014 um, will have to probably uh, reduce uh, the power of their engines by installing. Uh, an engine power limiter. So this is what it has to be done. There is nothing much about it. Uh, shipping companies must uh, get prepared to meet uh, the due date, which is the uh, first uh, IAPP certificate renewal after the 1st of January 23. There isn't much time, so uh, this process uh, should have started uh, at least uh, six months ago, I, I believe, uh, in order to be able to satisfy the regulation. Um, obviously, uh, ships have already started reducing speeds. Uh, this is an ongoing process. Uh, some time ago it was dictated, the speed reduction was dictated by the market. Nowadays it is dictated uh, by the uh, shipping market, I mean. Nowadays it is dictated by environmental regulations. So it will be done, but obviously this is not enough. Speed reduction is not enough uh, to satisfy uh, neither the de decarbonization targets set by IMO and the uh, European Union, nor by the CII uh, targets or limits, rather. Um, so what are we doing uh, to satisfy these uh, uh, limits? Um, there are things one can do. Uh, obviously, we must uh, improve uh, the energy efficiency of our ships in order to satisfy the limits or use a greener uh, fuel on board our ships. Um, as far as fuel is concerned, LNG is one option. I convert your ship into LNG if that's possible. It's very expensive and in most of the cases it is not possible. 
uh, or use uh, uh, biofuels, a certain percentage of uh, biofuels during the operation of your ships. Um, this is possible, it is expensive, it has not been tested widely, but it is possible. Um, and uh, on the efficiency side, what we are doing, uh, we are looking at um, options like uh, bulbous bow modification or propeller uh, change. Uh, this it can be done in uh, large container ships. Um, we are doing uh, possibly more frequent uh, dry dockings, um, uh, application of uh, silicon paints, uh, better or wider uh, blasting of uh, the underwater parts of, of, of the hull. Um, obviously, you may use ducts, uh, propeller fins. Uh, this is also a possibility. Root optimization uh, may uh, give you a few percentage uh, uh, more efficient uh, operation. Um, I, I, I believe that uh, these are the, um, how can I say, the easiest ways to deal with the problem. Uh, obviously, each one requires a lot of investment. It's not, uh, I mean, uh, changing the propeller uh, requires uh, expensive studies and expensive modifications. Uh, but if you can um, uh, e extend the commercial life of your vessel by a few years, uh, it uh, may make sense. Thank you, Sri. Thank you, thank you, Margot. Very interesting. <clears throat> there are a lot of ideas and uh, a lot of money to be taken out of the pockets. Important is to find them. Costa, bishops, what is your idea for this new uh, I mean, situation? As a third party manager, I think uh, I will not be commenting on the commercial side of the uh, CI. I, and, uh, However, what I have to say is that uh, the industry has shown an adaptability in on the new regulations, and we have seen that, and uh, shipping has been uh, quite good in that. Um, the fact that uh, within the group we have a large number of various type of vessels has taught us how to be able to gather data and proactively be there uh, and when we talk about energy efficiency on the passenger ship, for example, we have applied the, 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 the efficiency um, a, a number of years ago. Um, so we know what is happening, we know what is expected to happen. Um, uh, CII is an operational, as Piros and the rest of the panelists have said, um, uh, requires calibration, probably requires calibration. Uh, as commercially, uh, the way it looks or is calculated probably is not accurate. Um, uh, however, since we have seen that this is coming up, this is coming to stay on the way that is going to stay. What uh, what requires a good ship manager to be behind and doing it is certainly a very professional performance management team. I mean, monitoring every single mile of your vessel, uh, making sure that it, this is aligned with your crew element, so your crews on board the vessel, they should be aligned with your performance monitoring and make sure that they understand that the cost of an extra generator up might cost something. But, um, uh, and we have seen that in the past we have been on the container side as well, we have been adaptive in uh, making sure that slow steaming on so large engines is happening by cutting down the, the turbochargers, for example. And so we, we have been able proactively to look at uh, beforehand also those areas. Um, 
my comment here and addition would be that while shipping ship managers and operators they need to look at their energy efficiency from their side we we seem to be lacking the same having from the infrastructure as well uh, so where are the where is the infrastructure for example to make sure that the amp so the electric uh, the cold iron famous cold iron is there in place to make sure that a vessel while in port is able to use uh, an alternative means of power and and, and, and stop this environmental uh, hazard. Uh, or even more, where is the, uh, the proactive communication, uh, at least on the liner business, between the, the, the port authorities of the, of the port where they're expecting the vessel to arrive and the congestion, so that the vessel departs at the normal speed to, to arrive at the normal seat. I've seen recently, I was, I mean, uh, on, on the airplane uh, business, uh, the, the, the plane is not departing from the previous port if he doesn't know that the slot will open by that time to be able to add one. So, you know, why not to adapt something like that within uh, our, uh, our shipping environment? Uh, simple things that it, it will not cost and will make certainly uh, our way, our uh, approach uh, but Costa, very well said, thank you. Uh, absolutely, that's the point which is very important, that shipping alone cannot uh, do everything. It's a part of a whole chain of things that has been said more than once at this uh, conference of today, is a message. But nevertheless, yes, we are trying to find ideas what we can do uh, regardless of what the whole um, value chain will do on that. And closing this first round of questions on the same topic, George, can you please send us about, uh, tell us about your strategy for the CII mainly for the next year? Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, well, decarbonizing uh, our, our industry is uh, something that uh, has, is starting. We're at the beginning, at the first levels of this uh, decarbonization. It's not something that uh, we have to, to deal with. The whole, uh, I think, uh, every business aspect, even you know, us as consumers, we have to decarbonize in order to make sure that we will meet uh, the target to 2050. So it's an ongoing uh, process. I think uh, shipping has always been very adaptive to changes, and I'm very confident that uh, we will adapt to whatever is uh, required. It will need a lot of collaboration in general from different stakeholders to make sure that we all understand and we all make contributions to this to the solution of the problem, starting from uh, the technology, from shipbuilding, engine makers, the technology needs to catch up to maybe even lower emissions. We have done it uh, for uh, uh, our transportation, our land transportation. We need maybe to do it uh, here. It has to become also the technology a little bit uh, more uh, uh, affordable and we definitely need uh, additional uh, training, I think, on the human element, both uh, onshore and uh, ashore, in order to make sure that uh, uh, what uh, we will be, what, you know, we will be doing tomorrow, people will know how to use it uh, efficiently. Of course, a lot of the things that have been said uh, here, like uh, slow steaming, we are seeing slow steaming being uh, practiced, and I think we are going to see even more slow steaming happening as we go go along. And most probably, it's going to be institutionalized. Uh, we fuel is the most important thing in the emissions today, and how we are going to tackle the, the problem. Uh, as a company, we use uh, low sulfur fuel oils to deal uh, with. The intention is to look at uh, LNG, LNG and biofuels as uh, intermediary uh, fuels because they will not uh, solve the problem in full. So when the other types of fuels, the net uh, zero fuels, will be available, which we don't know when this is going to happen, if it's going to be to, to 2026, 2030 or later, I think we will try also to experiment with uh, this uh, type of uh, fuels uh, as well. We have, generally speaking, a very young uh, fleet. But the majority of the vessels have been built uh, after 2015. So you understand that uh, some of uh, the design savings in operating with this uh, fleet are already 
are already there. However, like I think uh, everybody here, we are uh, monitoring the performance uh, of each vessel, even on a single base, uh, uh, on an every, every voyage that we do, in order to make sure that if we need to take uh, corrective action uh, with our charter or with you know, our operating team, we do it pro uh, proactively now rather than wait uh, for um, the time to pass and then deal with uh, maybe a vessel that will not be very favorably ranked at uh, the end of uh, the year. And uh, we have uh, the, the plan for the companies to, uh, to sell some of uh, the older vessels that we have, and I think the environment is favorable as we speak right now to, to sell. There are people who are buying older vessels. Uh, and invest, of course, in uh, what is available today, and today is uh, dual fuel vessels, uh, uh, LNG powered vessels. We have uh, started our investments with four uh, Aframaxes, and the goal is to be full uh, dual fuel uh, fleet, to have a full dual fuel fleet uh, until uh, 2030. Thank you. Uh, thank you, George. Yes, we will come back a little bit more on the experiments that shipping companies are asked to do on regarding new fuels, and, uh, and I think uh, this is a very tricky ground, let's say, to touch. Um, I think it is clear from what you have said, all of you, that uh, in shipping, the optimization of operations is in our DNA. It is nothing new. It is something companies have been done forever, especially the Greek ones. Uh, I cannot remember any time in the past that the te technical department of a company or the operation department was doing anything else than optimizing the costs. And this is the reason also Greek shipping has been so... Um, uh, giving such a satisfaction to us. Um, but yes, there are new, new uh, approach, new challenges that we are facing. And I would like to go to George and Costas, uh, who are representing third party management, to ask them a little bit more. Uh, you differentiate from the other panelists on that respect. What uh, do you think, not only for decarbonization, but also for other, you want to make your fleets ready for I, I, I wish not another pandemic, of course, but uh, situations that we, we can face to bulletproof the fleets. Gregory, what is your uh, comments on that? Uh, like uh, logistic chain problems or uh, this kind of other issues? Yes, uh, regarding um, logistics, regarding issues that we recently all faced, uh, uh, geopolitical uncertainties regarding COVID. Uh, all this we all came across and uh, each of us were all together with sharing the information. We were able to go out of it and uh, uh, we are uh, able to, to see that some of the uh, implemented uh, what we faced and what we used, uh, we see that we still maintain some of them. Uh, digitalization, yes, we see that it uh, was a necessity to come out and uh, come into communication, internal or external, uh, digitalizers with certificates that also classification societies, some of them had, some of them did not have and they had to develop and still remains. Also, as you mentioned, the remote surveys. Um, the development also, uh, due to the COVID, to the part of uh, support to our group, uh, where we had to additionally develop uh, solutions like we did uh, for the One Care and uh, supplying, uh, being able to provide to the crew uh, mental uh, health and uh, well being in order to be able to address issues that uh, they have been dealing with on board vessel because digitalization has been able to address a lot of issues, but at the same time, when you had the seafarer being able to communicate with, uh, with the land, while that was not so often possible, uh, some of the troubles at home have been transferring to the onboard crew, and that had, uh, as we saw, the need for a mental support. Uh, so this, these services will remain, this support will remain. Uh, geopolitical uh, uncertainties, yes, we had to face, but this was also an opportunity in order to uh, investigate 
and to see where else we are able to meet the requirements and where able we are able to resource the necessary group. Within Columbia, we feel lucky that uh, we have been uh, developing our own 15 uh, mining uh, agencies, so that was uh, easy to pick up where we were able to reinforce uh, those uh, uh, and address these changes or where else we needed to, to expand, right, within uh, India, for example. Um, regarding the matter of, uh, of the COVID, uh, we all had uh, uh, to go through it and uh, see ourselves uh, becoming better, stronger. Uh, definitely, we will use, use still the digitalization and we will still use whatever uh, we developed uh, and we see that we can still uh, have this effective uh, for our uh, crew and also for the office. We had also the hologram that has been used to have another interactive uh, interference between crew in, uh, and our office staff in uh, Manila and uh, our uh, people that were not able to easily fly to places. Uh, this sort of uh, measures that we st still see that we will be able to maintain. Thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, many, many ideas. Thank you. Gentlemen, we need to run a little bit. Nicholas is already looking at me, becoming red there. The color change here. We have seven minutes to cover. We, we could cover the con Congress, I think, the whole forum with you five. Uh, Costa? I, I, will be, I will be very fast. So, I mean, everyone learned a lesson during the pandemic. And following the pandemic, the, the uh, political conflict uh, in Ukraine. So, Crewing was the number one element that we have been all affected. Trying of alternatives, we found alternatives. We have been able uh, to uh, man our vessels on time despite the difficulties. Logistics, logistics consolidation was the lesson learned. So we have a fleet predicting data of our PMS. We have been able to order in advance not making, not waiting for the last minute to place the orders for the, the spares or for the necessities that we might need on board. Taking on board our people, that was a difficult task. Um, uh, we managed to locate the resources of the group worldwide so that we make sure that we visit our vessels. Uh, remote is one thing, but physical is certainly better. And um, what we have learned from all this at the bottom line was uh, that the data analytics brought us a good feedback or information within our hands. And what I mean by data analytics, we have developed a system called, uh, I mean, through our platform, which is Ipsu, called Sentinel. Through Sentinel, we have been uh, pointing out the strengths and the weaknesses in every area of the KPI that we want within a vessel. If it is crew strength, if it is technical uh, expertise of uh, uh, the technical condition of the vessel, past per, uh, post stakeholder performance. So anything that you might need is within your reach to be able to take a decision as, as required. Thank you, Costa. Um, going back, a quick question to George that you already mentioned, you are experimenting at N with uh, alternative fuels. Have you already any fuel that you trust of the fuels that you are thinking of or already experimenting with or we have not, what you can share with us? We have not uh, done a live trial yet, but this is something that uh, we plan to do very soon within, uh, before, certainly before the end of uh, the year. Uh, it's not also very, very available. We, we understand that there is a lead time. Some suppliers, some of the major suppliers, need maybe two months from the order until you deliver. They deliver the product to you. So it's a lot of preparation that needs to take uh, place before you actually go to, to a live uh, a trial. And of course, uh, doing a trial uh, could be the easiest uh, thing. There are a lot of things that need to happen before we make sure that these transitional fuels can be used without creating uh, headaches for uh, ship owners, uh, technical managers, operators. And I think uh, it will be crucial uh, not uh, to repeat, uh, allow me to say, the mistakes 
that happened after the introduction of 0.5% uh, fuel oil, when uh, we uh, were, uh, we basically we are dealing right now with uh, a fuel that doesn't have a fixed specification. There are some intermediary, intermediary, let's say, specification, but not the final specification. And I'm saying that because blending to, to arrive at 0.5% uh, is done by everybody. This is very much unregulated. And of course, if on 0.5, uh, this uh, you have elements uh, in uh, the fuel that can harm your engine and therefore create a safety risk for uh, you know, your operation, you understand that on the biofuels, we're a little bit more skeptical because the concentration of some of these, uh, uh, some of these substances can be up to 30% or even higher. So we need to have a standard, and this uh, standard, first of all, needs to be enforceable. We need to have then a supply chain that will support, the, you know, have it readily available, because not, uh, the oil majors are not in every port. And we should, of course, make uh, the price of these uh, fuels very affordable, because right now they're two times, if not more, expensive than the regular uh, low sulfur fuel oil. Thank you, George. We have two minutes to cover two very small topics who I would like to touch. Uh, we haven't, we, one is human element. I would like to ask Piros. What do you think? All these kinds of things, humans are still around, or we have to replace them with uh, engines? I will be very quick. Uh, I hope you were here when uh, Mr. Dimuleas was, was talking about human element before in the uh, previous panel. Uh, the only thing that COVID did to the, to the shipping companies is to realize how important people are on board our vessels. And this is something that we need to realize two times and three times more. Um, we have to deal with new generations also that have other needs than what we had uh, 30 years ago. So uh, yes, it's a very crucial matter. I think that shipping companies, they took care of their people for so many years and they are going to take care of the new generations also. They are going to train them. Uh, we need to train them and we, are, we have to keep them uh, physically and mentally safe. Mental is the last part that we learn now and we have to do it. Uh, people need a life on board and we have to give it. So. Spiro, thank you for being very to the point and transmitting a very clear message. Marco, would you like to close with some comments on human element or probably on other elements that are affecting your decisions like charters? How do you face charter parties? How do you intend next year to do it? Um, yes, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. <laughs> and, um, one, um, one problem that uh, we are dealing with uh, at this time is uh, um, the so-called CII clause in charter parties. Um, and uh, apparently BIMCO is uh, trying to balance uh, between uh, owners and charters uh, requirements and they are having a difficulty publishing uh, a widely accepted clause. Um, I, I would like to comment here that um, up to now uh, charters have been uh, dictating uh, the operational, the voyage speed and the routing of the ship. Um, however, uh, such instructions may now affect uh, the CII and thus the commercial life of, um, of, the, of, of the ships. Um, so it is very important uh, for the owner to cooperate uh, with the charter uh, to find um, a mutually acceptable uh, way of operating uh, the ships after the 1st of January 23. Uh, this won't be easy and it will require the cooperation uh, of the charters and the understanding of the owners. So this is a problem we have been facing. Uh, we see that um, a, a container uh, liner companies are more prepared and uh, they are willing to discuss um, mutually acceptable clauses. Uh, however, the dry uh, sector uh, is not prepared at all. 
so a lot of work must be done uh, in this area. Uh, one thing I, I would like to say is that uh, uh, just a comment to end uh, my uh, my speech here um, is that uh, seven, six years ago when I spoke uh, uh, at a similar conference in London, uh, when I mentioned uh, the requirement uh, for shipping to decarbonize. I had received a very hostile uh, response from the audience. The good thing is now that uh, the majority of the shipping participants have realized uh, the problem and uh, I hope that uh, this will be an inspiration for the young generation uh, to decarbonize our industry. Thank you. Thank you, Marco, and thanks everybody, jo jo uh, Gregory Spiros, Marcos Costas, George, thanks all. Thank you for your attention. Hope you. Thank you.